before we want to start this today's session, um, those who have followed us will remember that um, we have been holding these sessions. This is the third one, uh, what we are calling the Countdown U.S. Elections 2020, with a focus on implications for Africa. This is a virtual town hall debate session uh, that happens every Friday. And on uh, today's session, we are very privileged to have with us our guest speaker and a friend of the center, uh, and, and someone who has actually uh, had some interest in South Africa and Africa more broadly, Professor Virginia Dominguez, who is a professor of anthropology at University of Illinois, uh, Urbana-Champaign in the US, and uh, co-founder of one of the more important international uh, organizations of uh, research and academic engagement called the International Forum for U.S. Studies, uh, IFUS in, in, in short. Uh, and and uh, she's going to lead us in a discussion uh, on issues to do with the new left in the U.S. politics, uh, the implications of a Donald Trump or Joe Biden win for Africa, and lastly, an analysis of the meeting of Senator Kamala Harris as Joe Biden's running mate. Uh, after her discussion or presentation, if you wish, or uh, talk, uh, Professor Gilbert Kajagala, who is the director, as we all know, of the African Center for the Study of the US uh, at Wits University, the hosts of this show, will come in to respond. And then we'll open it up for question and answer for a virtual engagement where you can weigh in with your questions or comments and so forth. So without further ado, uh, I, I believe we shall share Professor Virginia's uh, full profile bio uh, on, the on the chat. Uh, but without further ado, I would like now to invite Professor Virginia to uh, the podium, the virtual podium at that. Uh, so Pro Professor Dom Virginia, welcome and all yours, yeah. Thank you very much, Bob, and uh, thank you, Gilbert, and thank the center. Yes, I was actually there just over a year ago. Um, I have been to South Africa several times, um, and uh, so I'm looking forward to this for a variety of reasons. I don't want to repeat what I actually you know, we're actually right in the middle of the two uh, conventions, the Democratic National Party Convention, which just ended about 10 hours ago, um, uh, Monday through Thursday of this week. And then next week, it's the Republican National uh, Party Convention. And uh, I think there are some interesting things to talk about here. We may not all agree. There was also a uh, very recent, I think, uh, yesterday or the day before, uh, CNN uh, poll done from August 14th to August 17th was actually uh, released, and there are some interesting, uh, some interesting information that I wanted to share with you. But l let me go back uh, just in case you know, some people have not actually read these things that I, that I wrote. Um, I, I love to argue that there is often a, I think probably outside the U.S. more than in the U.S., a misreading of uh, U.S. politics uh, or misunderstanding. Maybe, maybe I, I, I am saying something that is not true, that it could be that people are very, very knowledgeable, but I actually think that there is so much concern about President Trump, uh, both in my circles in the US and certainly in many, many circles outside the US, that, that many people actually are not noticing something I think is really important. And that is, as Bob put it, uh, what I call the rise of the 21st century left. It's, uh, it's not fringe. Um, French would be, for example, my colleagues in Rico, who 
always vote for independence whenever there's a referendum. And whenever they ask, well, how many, they get very excited, they get 4% of the vote. Um, they, they're for independence, the vast majority of the people who, who, who vote are really debating whether they want Puerto Rico a US state or to continue its commonwealth status. Um, but one, two, three, four, it's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about far greater numbers uh, and uh, some interesting surprises. Um, I think, you know, Bernie Sanders is uh, largely considered to be sort of the leader of that group. He often talks about it not as a party thing or as a faction, but actually as, as a movement. Um, it was interesting four years ago when he ran for president, he, uh, he said in the, on a number of occasions that he was actually surprised that he had gotten that far. What surprised me in many ways then and, and even more now is that the vast majority of, of his supporters and fans are not only very, very, very strongly devoted to him, but they, they're largely very young. They're, uh, they're the youngest voters. Uh, they're in their 20s and early to mid 30s. Uh, and uh, there are other people also who support him. But what was interesting also a few months ago when he began his campaign, um, I'd say even seven, eight months ago, uh, a lot of people came back. Now Bernie Sanders is four years older. Um, I don't think he will do this again in four years because by then I think he'll be in his 80s. Um, but I think, you know, he was very propelled to actually go forward and still has a very um, supporting base. So let me see if this works. I'm going to try to share the screen. Okay, let's see. This before. Does this work? Yes. You see? Yes. Okay. It is. Yeah. Okay. So let me. Great. Let me. Okay. Let me look, sort of leave this. Okay. Okay. So uh, just a little bit of before I share. Uh, some of the interesting results of, of the polls and make some comments about, about the Democratic National Convention as well. Uh, this is uh, some information on, on Bernie Sanders. Uh, now we obviously have both Elizabeth Warren and uh, what, who's often called uh, AOC Alex Alejandria, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, who are also very much part of that, which in the U.S., by the way, is called, usually called progressive, the progressive politics, not leftist politics, not socialist politics, but progressive politics. Anyway, this particular slide is uh, largely about uh, um, background Bernie Sanders. You know, in April 2015, he announced his campaign for the presidency of the U.S. Um, Notice that I, that I wrote here, initially considered her long shot. And it's not just my reading or scholars reading or me, it was also his reading. Uh, so he, he considered himself a long shot. He never really wanted uh, to, well, he never thought he would get very far. He thought he would actually affect the Democratic Party and the platform. And I think we could argue that he did then and he has now as well. Uh, he went on to win, however, 23 primaries and caucuses uh, in our spring, the year fall, and approximately 43% of pledged delegates to Hillary Clinton's 55%. His campaign was noted, I mean, I wrote here for his, uh, his supporters' enthusiasm, as I already said, as well as for his rejection of large donations from corporations the financial industry and any associated uh, super PAC, which is part of uh, the US. Okay, uh, so I wanna talk a little bit about polls. I know that polls are often wrong, people try. I don't 
do them, but they, they are often uh, done by people. Uh, I still think they show some some indication, some trends. So um, here is something I think is worth uh, mentioning. Late June 19 poll done by Emerson. Experience in doing polls and do them regularly. Uh, the director of that poll, Spencer Kimball, pointed out that quote, similar to our other polls, again, Emerson uh, polls a lot, uh, similar to our other polls, Biden and Sanders voters are the most loyal with 50% to 55% saying they are set on their candidates. Um, a, a reminder, you know, this is actually newsworthy in the US. Um, what's always worthy, and I think many of you actually know about this as well, is that we have a very low voter turnout rate even in presidential election years. Uh, when somebody gets to around 60%, we think it's a very high turnout. There's, I, I don't know that there's ever been, maybe in the early years of the US, but I, certainly not in my lifetime, there's, there's never been like 70, 80, 90%. Uh, so, when this says, you know, that, that uh, Biden and Sanders voters are the most loyal uh, uh, and that they are set on their candidates, I think it's very interesting. And uh, notice the other thing I put on this, on this slide. On head-to-head -head matchups, I will show you uh, the slide in a minute. Trump, President Trump, but it's just a quote. It says, Trump trails all of his Democratic opponents with Biden and Sanders holding 10-point leads. 55% to 45%, Warren leading by six, Buttigieg and Harris leading by four. Of course, now Sanders, Warren, Buttigieg, and Harris had all dropped out of, of the race since then. Um, but uh, here is the chart. I think I included this in, in the paper that, that I wrote that I think is on the website. But I think this is very interesting. Um, Notice that this is late June, June 21st to 24th, 2019. Um, and, you know, they're all very interesting. Trump Biden, Trump Sanders, Trump Warren, Trump Buttigieg, Trump Harris. I would say here Sanders and Warren certainly represent the thing that is called progressive Democrats uh, in, in the U.S. Harris, to some extent, and I'm talking about Kamala Harris in a minute because clearly uh, she is now the Democratic Party nominee for vice president. But I think this is very useful. Now here is a lot of uh, text here. The, the smaller font underneath is mostly there uh, as background. It's about the actual poll when it was conducted, how they did it, etc. But what I wanted to really show you is what's in the top part of this slide. And that's again taken from a lot of this information that I have, including quotes from uh, the director of the Emerson poll. Overall, it says voters have not acclimated to a candidate who describes themselves as a democratic socialist, with 43% saying that they would not for a candidate with this label. This is of the general population. 30% of voters indicating they would vote for a democratic socialist. 27% uh, unsure. Among Democratic primary voters, 56% said they would consider voting for a Democratic Socialist, which is the phrase that Sam often used to describe himself when asked if he's a socialist, is he's a Democratic Socialist. I'm not 100% sure what that means. I think I know what he's doing when he does that, but nonetheless, what's interesting here is that 56% of people polled who are members of the Democratic Party uh, said they would consider voting for a Democratic Socialist. That is to say, would they consider voting for a Sanders, would consider voting for anyone who called himself or herself a Democratic Socialist. 15% said they would not and 29% were unsure. Uh, notice what Kimball then, then says, uh, the problem for Sanders and others who describe themselves as democratic socialists is that independents are opposed, 
six percent, and that might be a problem for a Democratic nominee to come in a general election. Um, one thing I think many of you may know, but but I'm not sure that that this uh, is generally known, is that a lot of the um, officials, a lot of the uh, the mainstream, the really active members of the Democratic National Committee and the party were really quite concerned uh, early on in this uh, primary election season when uh, Sanders was doing really well, uh, when primaries and caucuses, and uh, they were afraid that, uh, that he might win, that he might have enough delegates to actually win the nomination. Uh, and, and why they were concerned is interesting. Uh, they were concerned because they, they don't do what Trump does, which is to describe the entire Democratic Party as a radical left, um, his, his words. But they actually often think that Sanders and even Warren are part of a section of the Democratic Party that is too, too leftist for the majority of Americans and therefore that if Sanders were the nominee of the Democratic Party this year, they would definitely risk losing the presidential election. And uh, beating Donald Trump is, is probably so important to them that they did not want to do this. Uh, let me skip that. So I think I've got the Bernie Sanders up here, but I don't need that. Uh, so it, let me actually some things that uh, I think are also useful before I, sh I show you some of the uh, latest uh, statistics. Uh, on Bernie Sanders. One of the interesting things about this particular uh, convention, besides the fact that it's the first one that's ever done virtually, uh, is that uh, the, when there is a roll call by, by state or territory, the people who actually vote for the nomination of the Democratic Party, I, I noticed that the uh, majority um, in most cases were actually voting for Joe Biden as the party's nominee, but actually quite a few were also voting for Bernie Sanders still. Um, all of the other people who ran for president of the US uh, had basically released their delegates and uh, um, Sanders did not want to. So one of the things that he did was that he brokered, he made a deal, uh, even after he stopped his campaign for president. Uh, and the deal consisted of a variety of things, but I hear a highlight in red, two things that I think are important. One, that Sanders would be able to keep most of the delegates he got in the primaries, and we saw that. Uh, that Sanders was able to fill state delegate and standing convention committee slots that he would have been eligible for if he had uh, maintained an active campaign. Uh, that's not normally done. And uh, this had to do with the fact that, that uh, Sanders and a lot of his supporters really want to move the US Democratic Party further to the left in its policies and its platforms. Um, but interesting here is if you read the, uh, the, two, the, the bottom of the slides, you'll see that there's agreement on, on, on beating Donald Trump. Biden and Sanders both want to defeat Donald Trump. That, that Biden has made a point, and it was really obvious also in this particular convention that just ended a few hours ago. Um, Biden really wants to attract uh, Bernie Sanders, you know, the, the, the bros, Bernie bros. Uh, but uh, Biden really wants to attract his supporters. And I still think that while uh, Sanders wants his supporters to also vote for Biden, uh, he wants them to vote for Biden as an anti-Trump vote. Um, I don't think, uh, I personally don't think that they will all do that. I think some of them will stay home. I think some of them may vote for lots of other things and just skip that. I may be wrong, but if that's the case, then I think Trump may very well win again. And it was really obvious over the last four days that 
a lot of, of the speakers were actually urging people, young people especially, to vote, young African Americans to vote, uh, simply to vote, not stay home. And uh, this included Sanders. So um, that Biden actually cares about Sanders supporters, there's a great deal about um, that group that's not yet, I think, large enough to really dominate in the US, but that is a whole lot more than one, two, three, four percent, I would say, I don't know, 27 to 47 percent. Um, so Sanders and Biden have actually announced uh, six policy working groups. Uh, these have a whole lot to do with Biden, but they probably have even more to do with Bernie Sanders' positions and the positions of those so-called progressives. Uh, so they are on immigration, on criminal justice, on the economy, and climate action, on education, and uh, healthcare. Okay, so here are uh, some of, of the polling information that was just released, I think on Wednesday, I'm not positive. Uh, it's, um, August 14 to 17, CNN uh, poll. Uh, it says the result of that was just at this point is just data. Nearly seven in ten, so almost 70 percent of folks in the U.S. say that the U.S. response to the coronavirus outbreak makes them feel embarrassed. Uh, at this, a lot of the media picked up on on this, the embarrassment issue. Um, the new poll, this poll again, uh, finds disapproval of Trump's handling of the outbreak at a new high, 58%. And as the share, they sh the share who say the worst of the pandemic is yet to come has risen to 55% after dropping through the spring, our spring, your fall. And as the virus is spread from the nation's cities throughout the countryside, the number of one who's been diagnosed with the virus has jumped dramatically to basically two thirds, up from 40% in early June. Uh, I have just picked a few things on this. You can, you can look this up. I urge you to actually look this up. Uh, you can probably easily find this on the internet if you just put in a CNN uh, August 19th uh, poll or something like that. Um, and yet, you know, here's part of what I have argued before, and I think, uh, I, I don't know what to make of this, except that I think it's worth uh, noticing. Uh, that it's deeply divided. I have often said divided. Now I think there's a whole other level of, of emotion. Uh, the number of people I know who say they absolutely hate Trump uh, is, is, is high. Um, it's not, you know, it's not like the intelligence of George W. Bush. It's not, it's not anything else. It's, uh, you, you heard this a lot in a lot of the speeches of the last four days, the Democratic National Committee, uh, people including President, former President Obama saying uh, that, that Donald Trump is the most dangerous president uh, in the history of these. So there's a whole level of emotion that's different. But I think it would really be a mistake to think that Donald Trump doesn't also have really avid uh, supporters, because I think he does, as you will see uh, shortly uh, on these slides, there is increasing information that I think is, is important to note. Uh, the mid-August 2020 CNN poll shows that Democrats may be nearly unanimous in saying that they're more embarrassed than proud about the U.S. response to the virus. Notice this, the percentages here, 93% embarrassed, 5% proud, Democrats. But it also shows that Republicans, members of the U.S. Republican Party, are mostly proud. 61% say that they are proud versus 33% who say they are embarrassed. Uh, and this is really just about uh, the coronavirus, which I, I, th I know it's bad in South Africa, but, but uh, 
think even percentage-wise, it's uh, as bad in Brazil as well, but it's horrendous in the U.S. Over five and a half million people have actually gotten the virus, and over 173,000 have died in the last months of the virus. Um, so that's that's what they're responding to. But here are some more things from the uh, what poll was just released a couple of days ago. Um, Democrats, 76%, and independents, 58%, are far more likely to say the worst is yet to come in the outbreak than our Republicans. And look, look at the difference. 76% versus 26%. The poll finds a massive four point gap between the percentages of Republicans and Democrats who say they're comfortable returning to their regular routines today. 82% among Republicans, 18% among Democrats. Uh, these, these really big differences are what I'm talking about when, I, when I'm talking about the, the US is deeply, deeply divided and uh, uh, more so than, than usual. Here are some other things that I thought were worth sharing with you. Um, this is a quote, I probably wouldn't have put it that way, but this is a quote. Um, Trump's approval rating for handling the economy is, is now, according to this particular CNN poll, uh, up to 51%. Uh, Trump often thinks that the media in general is way too liberal, radical left, whatever his terms are. But uh, this was a CNN poll. And the CNN, if, this, if CNN is actually saying that according to this poll, Trump's approval rating for handling the is now up to 51%, that's quite significant. In, in all sorts of other ways, uh, his general approval rating is low. And uh, we know that, we've seen that, uh, even if one averages polls from a whole variety of, of other things. Uh, I don't think I included this, but now the average is 51% uh, for Biden, 42% for Trump. Um, and this includes polls done in July um, and June and August uh, by Fox News, ABC and Washington Post together, the Reuters, NBC, uh, Quinnipiac University, which does a lot of these, uh, Monmouth University, which also does a lot of these. So uh, the lowest of these uh, that we see for uh, Biden is 43% in, in uh, early, early, June, uh, early July. Reuters uh, poll, 43%, Biden, 37%. Uh, Trump. Uh, the highest of the Trump ones, according to these overall ones, is Jews, uh, 41%, Mount University, 41%. In general, basically, his, his numbers are low, but not his approval rating for handling the economy. And we could talk about that. Americans, however, don't yet see much improvement in the economic downturn caused by the coronavirus. In fact, oh, sorry. Where were I? Okay. 3% now say that the economy is continuing to worsen. That's a little bit less than half. Up from, it, it may be up from 36% who felt that way in June, but it's actually still a little bit less than half, as you see. About a quarter, that is 25%, say that the economy is beginning to recover and 31% think it has stabilized, it is no longer worsening, but also not yet improving. Um, this is not broken down into Republicans and Democrats. Um, just, about half of those polls say that they're facing financial hardship due to the coronavirus. Uh, that's a figure that has held roughly steady since uh, April. Um, about 80%. About eight in 10 say that they are at least somewhat angry about the way things are going in the country today, including an astonishing, this is a quote, I, I think it's uh, unusual to see that word used in these things, but it says, including an astonishing 51% who's very angry. 
CNN has actually asked this question in polling periodically since 2008. And the previous high for the share who said they were very angry was 30 and reached in 08 and 16. So uh, again, um, there are lots of ways of interpreting this and I would be very interested to see what you all uh, think is good. Uh, one of the things that I think important here is again to see very angry. It has to do with the level of emotion and the level of split that we're talking about. Um, we saw this this week, a whole lot of people, again, delegates from lots of different states were uh, still voting for, uh, for Bernie Sanders, and actually Bernie Sanders was not, and his nomination second. So um, Biden still leads in all the national polls, uh, but his lead in what in the U.S. are called battleground states sometimes toss-up states, has narrowed considerably to just over half. Uh, and, you know, these were done obviously before, uh, before the start of this convention. Uh, you know, I don't know when there will be polls uh, right after this convention ends. There probably are some because it's generally done, but then, you know, the Republican Party convention is next week, and so it will be very interesting to see. Uh, here are sort of just uh, some last things that I wanted to uh, actually share with you. There are two, two slides. Uh, Mother Jones is an interesting publication. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's mainstream. Um, I, I do think that, that some of the things that came out in an article just a few days ago, uh, say a lot about the impact of what I'm calling the rise of this new 21st century left. Um, in 2016, Sanders remained in the primary until the bitter end, they write, uh, mainly to make a point, says Mother Jones. Delegates would be the only way for an outsider to have a say in the party's direction. This cycle, notice I, I, I'm the one who put this in red. Uh, it was not that way um, before. This cycle, with meaning this particular uh, year, 2020, uh, Sanders opted for the inside route. He suspended his as soon as his path to the nomination became impossible and sent aides to negotiate favorable terms of surrender. That was the terminology. That resulted in the called Unity Task Forces, in which Sanders and Biden allies jointly develop policy recommendations that I mentioned earlier on immigration, criminal reform, justice, uh, justice in general, climate action, et cetera. Uh, it, this particular article from Mother Jones, again from August 14th, uh, actually is, we're in a much better position today than we were in 2016. It's slightly small font, but maybe you can make this bigger. Thanks in part, I, I, I put this in red, by the way. It's in part to those efforts. Biden is now running in the most progressive presidential platform in modern history. Notice the use of the word progressive, but also notice what it's saying. Biden, not Sanders. Biden is now running the most progressive presidential platform in modern history. The draft DNC Democratic National Committee platform, which delegates are voting on this week, includes its first ever nod to Medicare for all, which is an idea that Sanders pushed throughout all the debates and in, in his entire campaign, um, noting that Democrats, quote, welcome advocates who support the single payer approach. This is again a Sanders idea. The DNC, the Democratic National Committee Rules Committee, voted unanimously to extend the 2018 provision that limits the powers of superdelegates. Again, it's Sanders' idea. Uh, and quote from Jasmine Tabe, a, a DNC member and Sanders supporter from Virginia. We're in a much better position today than we were in 2016. We're able to advise the Bernie supporters on the outside. So uh, let me stop sharing here. Okay, so, oh, you're, you're back. Okay, 
Uh, you see me now? Yeah. Okay. I see Bob. No. Okay. All right. So um, let me let me address a couple of other things before Gilbert pipes in and you know, we hear some things. Uh, it was really only last week that uh, the Joe Biden announced his vice presidential. Uh, I think last Tuesday, uh, Tuesday of last week. Uh, let's say a couple of things about that. Uh, one is typically uh, the uh, the person who leads the process of nomination and who becomes the Democratic or Republican Party nominee usually announces the vice presidential uh, nominee basically at the convention. Um, I. I know that it seemed like Biden was taking a really long time to make his choice, or at least public with his choice. But um, if I think back, I actually think that that he might have been under a fair amount of pressure to do so. Uh, he had already publicly said he was a woman, and the question was which one. Um, and as the 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 protests throughout the winter uh, happened here initially having to do with the police killing of George Floyd in Minnesota uh, but then it spread out and a lot of it was taken away by the Black Lives Matter movement so I think there is more and more pressure for Biden to choose uh, a woman who in the U.S. would be called of color. Uh, what this actually meant was not only was uh, Bernie Sanders not going to be a nominee, I don't think he would have accepted anyway. Uh, I think there was a, a lot of discussion of the possibility of having an um, uh, African diaspora, African American, uh, as the vice presidential nominee. His choice of Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris is, is quite interesting for lots of reasons. Um, I, I'm not sure, frankly, uh, if Elizabeth Warren um, would have, would have um, been willing to be vice president. I know she said she would, but I, I think, you know, they differ quite a bit and she's quite outspoken. So I think um, she's obviously also, although she has said, you know, she has not some ancestry as Cherokee. Uh, I don't think that 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 was going to work. So part of the question was then who? Uh, what's interesting about Kamala Harris is that the U.S. Uh, in general is doing a lot of what they did with Barack Obama. Uh, before, which is to claim her like they claimed him. Um, certainly not immediately and not everyone, but but uh, significantly as the uh, African uh, Her father was from Jamaica. Her mother was from India. Um, they met in the U.S. when they were both actually at the university study. Um, she comes from a highly motivated uh, background, um, but I think her parents basically got divorced when she was five or six and her mother moved to Montreal. Her mother was a cancer re researcher, her father an economist who is now retired from the economics faculty. Um, but I think she basically ended up living most of her life with her mother. And she definitely did secondary school in Montreal, in Canada. What's also interesting is, I don't know what prompted her to do this, but she went to Howard, which is a historically black university, um, an elite, but historically black university in the US. Um, she could have done all sorts of other things, but that's where she went, and I think that matters to her. Um, I, then, I know she then went to California to the law school at Berkeley, uh, and she went to, uh, to law school. She then developed his whole, her whole career up to now uh, as, as a senior attorney, district attorney, 
Attorney General for the state of California, uh, in law in California. Uh, what is interesting to me about that is I don't, to be honest, and this may be something you all want to, to, to discuss and debate, I don't know uh, how committed she actually is to uh, Africa, African countries. I do know that she and Biden are both very committed to not being racist and to fighting the legacy of structural racism. Uh, and that makes them very, very different from Trump, who is much more concerned about making, making America great again, um, making the US, they don't mean the whole hemisphere, they actually mean the US, making the US great again. Um, and that means pretty much ignoring most of the world, most of the world's issues, except maybe for the giant countries, India, um, China, Russia, possibly Brazil, but sure. African countries, including South Africa, are just not, not gonna rate very highly on Trump's agenda. So if he's elected again in, in November, we are not likely to see a change, certainly not uh, a change for the better, possibly a change for the worse. Uh, if Biden and Harris are actually elected, I think they will, this may surprise you coming from me, and I am here in the US, but um, I think they will be uh, far more international, far more collaborative, a lot more like, uh, of President Obama, um, but I think they will also actually largely be very US. Um, and like many empires before, um, this one is very self-centered. They're very inward looking. So uh, they don't really even recognize the ways in which they favor the U.S. or assume that things everywhere in the world are or should be like they are in the U.S. So I th think Biden and Harris would actually be better for South Africa and for many African uh, countries, certainly than Trump. I don't have any doubt about that. But the doubt I do have is whether they would actually listen, uh, whether they would actually really uh, see uh, Africa as as a continent that they that they care about as opposed to a continent that they would like to to raise to standards that matter in the U.S. So uh, I have some doubts about that. Um, lastly, I think uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, I don't know how I see that particular dynamic. Um, Biden and Harris combined uh, may very well get uh, a whole lot of the Democratic vote. Uh, they may get a whole lot of the, I don't know, so the independent vote, uh, uh, people who have chosen not to be members of one or another major party. But um, I actually think there is a pretty good chance that they will not win the election. Um, this may have to do with, we could be very cynical. This may have to do with things Trump does. Um, the, the entire you know thing about uh, mail-in ballots seems to be sort of absurd, but it, it seems to be the last, the most recent thing that, that he's doing to, in his mind, apparently, affect the outcome of the election. Many, many people thought that this particular pandemic uh, is going to basically sink. I think he worries about that as well, uh, which is probably one of the reasons he basically told uh, many state governors to go ahead and, and, and change lockdown orders. And it's called opening up the economy. Um, some of them are now changing tunes because of the high rate of infection in the last two to three months. Um, but I think that people are, are 
probably going to be surprised more than I think they were uh, four years ago. Many people thought Hillary Clinton was going to win, would be the first woman president of the US, and that didn't happen. We have this odd uh, thing in the US, we still do, that was set up when this country was set up. Um, electoral college votes are what really matter. Um, Hillary Clinton got many, many, many more um, votes directly than, the, than uh, Donald Trump did four years ago, and yet he won the electoral college votes, and that's why he's president. Uh, this has not happened a lot in U.S. history, if I'm not mistaken. I think the first time it happened in, in U.S. history was 1876 with Rutherford B. Haynes who became president uh, when the Electoral College basically chose him. Uh, but interestingly, I think it has happened twice in the first two decades of the uh, 21st century. So again, you know, we could interpret that in a variety of ways. I mean, many people think the Electoral College needs to go. Obviously, uh, people who don't like Trump uh, are quite convinced that the Electoral College needs to go. People who, who, who are fans of Trump would certainly not do that, but I think it's very important to actually think about it. Um, to think about the fact that the same thing may happen now. And that's why I said earlier that battleground states may matter more here and it is now like 50-50 and Biden is still ahead, it's just slightly ahead. And who knows what's gonna happen in the next two months. I think it's now 74, 75 days till the election. Um, so let, let me leave it at that and see what Gilbert has to say. Open. Right, I think let's just go straight to Gilbert. I think one of the shockers that uh, uh, of, of your discussion is the uh, prediction uh, almost that uh, you know Biden uh, Kamala Harris ticket might not win. I think it comes at a, as a substantial shock for many of us. But let's hear what Gilbert has to say. But Bob, let me just say one thing before we let Gilbert come in. I I, I understand that it comes as a shock, but um, I am one of the few people I know who thought four years ago that Donald Trump had a chance. Nobody else I knew did, but I was <laughs> watching. I was sort of watching the polls. I was watching all sorts of things Trump was doing in the debates, etc. And I thought, you know, if it's really close, it's going to largely depend on whether people come out to vote. And the people who apparently did not vote for for Hillary Clinton and who probably probably ensured Trump's win were. Uh, Bernie supporters who could not bring themselves to vote for Hillary. Uh, so, you know, you put it in perspective. I thought it was possible. Not that I wanted it, but I thought it was possible. I think it's important to actually think the same thing now. Uh, a lot of people are kind of complacent, but I, the amount, I, I don't think this is true of the Democratic Party, nor do I think it's true of Biden, because over the last four nights here, uh, when I have watched them religiously watching the conventions, um, there was a lot of emphasis on going and voting, going and voting, going and voting. And uh, I don't think they would do that if they thought Trump was certainly going to, to lose. So uh, yes, it's a shock, but I think we should be prepared for that. All right. Thanks. I think on, on, on that sobering note, let's have Gilbert respond. <laughs> uh, thank you, Bob. And uh, Virginia, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. The spirit of, the, of this uh, discussion today was really to get your perspective, because you are here uh, about a year ago at our really remarkable conference on the cultures of populism. Right. And uh, so we, you, you did present a paper that uh, you generously shared with us. It's on our website. And a lot of the discussions I think you presented uh, were from that paper. So I encourage everybody really to, to go to our website and uh, read that paper, which was presented here. 
But I'm also excited that, in fact, uh, your presentation now is a, a presentation to a wider or to a global audience on an issue that has not gone away. And uh, it was also good that you could update us with, uh, with, the, with the interesting uh, polls and the data that is actually coming up. But I also wanted to say that uh, um, uh, Virginia's uh, uh, engagement with us is actually going to be a bigger engagement because uh, after the conference we had last year, we decided that uh, we are going to forge a partnership between the Africa Center for the Study of the US and the International uh, Forum for US Studies, uh, uh, which is based at uh, uh, University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, where uh, uh, Virginia is based. Uh, Mal uh, Williams and Adam Levine were supposed to go, and I, we were supposed to go to, to Urbana Champagne. Uh, we had booked our tickets and then uh, COVID hit us. So I just want to remind us that, uh, uh, or to remind Virginia and the audience that in fact, this partnership with uh, IFOS and the University of uh, Illinois in general is very significant for building our US partnership. So I'm glad that uh, uh, Virginia was also able to, to come and uh, give her presentation. The spirit of, I think, uh, this uh, the conversation is to allow African audiences to better understand US politics. Uh, and it's a very appropriate year that we're having an election that is so polarized uh, and, and so internationalized uh, so it was important that we get your perspective on exactly what is happening on the ground. It is also important for you, for us to get that perspective because I have never been a very good student of domestic US politics, <laughs> uh, even though I lived in the US for 20 plus years, but never really uh, was an expert. So I, I, I my, uh, my comments, uh, my remarks are literally to respond to some of the things that you've said, and then we can allow the, the audience really to ask as many questions as, uh, as they can, because you are on the ground. And, uh, and I think we need that perspective, especially for us who are in Africa, to hear exactly what is happening. And, and that's why I was intrigued by the last uh, uh, conversation between you and Bob on, uh, on the predictions. And so we should come back to that at the at discussions uh, uh, during the question and answer period. I think in responding to your paper in general, uh, what I want to say is that the discussion of the new left is actually very critical because it forces us to go back to the significance of ideology in politics. I think in the 90s, uh, after the end of the Cold War, we started to say the end of ideology. Uh, but your paper brings out very clearly really the significance of ideological divides within the US political divide, the, the US political space. And you make it very clear that uh, in fact, the Trump phenomena is not a new phenomenon, uh, that uh, it's been within the political marketplace for, for many years. So I think ideology is also important uh, to raise because I think without ideology, uh, there is, ideology is the, is, is the stuff of politics. Uh, ideology allows us, in fact, to distinguish between candidates or parties. So I think as we re return to the issues of ethnic, or oh, sorry, <laughs> ideological polarization in the US political space, I think we do have to appreciate that it is important for, for people, for parties to have distinctive positions. Uh, and then how to understand the new forms of ideology, I think is important. So your paper brings out very interestingly, the notion around uh, Bernie Sanders uh, and the socialist wave that you clearly define. And I like it because you also come back to the fact that very recently, in fact, this week, uh, Bernie Sanders is still standing very tall mm -hmm. and he's still saying my, my principles and my policies are important for the Democratic Party. And you ended, in fact, on the note uh, that what Biden is doing is, is essentially trying to domesticate some of <laughs> Bernie Sanders' uh, socialist policies. So I, I think the, the notion of ideology is important. But the other component of ideology is 
the issue of generational change, which you bring out very clearly in the paper. Often the supporters of Bernie Sanders have been the youth, the young, uh, very well educated, uh, but very skeptical of neoliberal policy. Uh, but also youth wanting to make a change within the larger voting landscape. Uh, so I think the fact that uh, the youth are galvanized around uh, quasi-socialist policies, I think gives us a, 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 new, a new angle around US politics. At least ideology has come up and we have the new carriers of this ideology who are the young people. So probably <laughs> that is the most promising component of, uh, of the notion around ideology and Bernie Sanders and the reconfiguration of the, the Democratic Party. And I think that's an important point you bring up. The other point I wanted to say is that ideology is not bad because I think what is happening in the US, my reading of the, what, you, what is happening in the US, and you put it very clearly, the issue is not really about ideology. The issue is around the polarization of politics. Uh, the question around why the extreme polarization of the political space. Ideology may be critical, uh, but uh, the, the wave of extreme polarization is problematic because I think what polarization has done, and that is exacerbated by the Trump administration, is essentially to begin to reduce the political faith in the political process. I think the civic, civics, if there's no civic engagement, if there's no uh, polite discussion, polite competition, then I think American politics enters into a very dangerous, uh, a very dangerous uh, political, uh, political context. I think so the problem is more polarization than I think ideology. I think what polarization has done is uh, it has in fact enhanced institutional gridlock. Uh, I think there was always a sense of, you know, institutions work and institutions can stand beyond the fray of parties. Uh, Congress in fact can, mo can legislate uh, almost on, a, on, a mod on moderate line. Uh, but the problem under Trump and I think, and this is also not new, is therefore how this institutional gridlock is beginning to impact, I think, decision making. Uh, I think I also, you, you hint at uh, the degradation of the checks and balances, I think within the, within the US system, which is, uh, which is uh, what most people are afraid about. And then of course, the, the bigger issue that is now coming up about electoral administration. Uh, if the US cannot have credible elections, then who else is going to have credible elections? So I, I think the, the degradation of electoral processes to me is uh, what, I, what, what would be the danger. And of course the rest of the world is looking at that com component. Can the US run credible elections? Uh, uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, is Trump going to use uh, his, uh, his, his, his fiat, his power, in fact, to, to disenfranchise uh, um, Americans who should be voting? And I think these are the bigger concerns I think your paper, your paper raises. Uh, I want to go into the Africa US. We had a good discussion two weeks ago around uh, what is the meaning of uh, US elections? Is Trump or Biden going to make a difference? And I don't want to go back into those debates uh, because my paper is going to be published uh, very, very soon. But what I'm going to say is that I actually I agree largely with what Virginia is saying. The US has had very few strategic interests in Africa, and therefore that kind of insularity of the American, the, the, the insularity of the American political and geographical space makes it really less salient uh, in terms of uh, uh, African issues. And so my point that I made in the last discussion was that there's more continuity in US Africa policies towards, uh, across the administrations, uh, whether they be Democrat or, or uh, Republican. But I, so I think that's the point you are talking about when you're saying there's America, the America first policy is, is, not, is not entirely new. Uh, I think Trump has just heightened it. So uh, we have to be, my point in that discussion, we have to be very cautious about how we read 
the Biden or the Trump. And, uh, and, and uh, I, I want to stop at that, but I think I agree with you that uh, probably there is not going to be any fundamental change. I think the more interesting issue on uh, US elections and Africa today is the article by uh, John Stremler, who I debated uh, the last time. And, and, and John has a good article today in the conversation where he's uh, taking an interesting line uh, that because uh, Trump is going to corrupt the US election, he's going to disenfranchise the majority of the people who should be voting, the African Union and the African countries should take a position that this is not a good idea. <laughs> and so it's a very intriguing uh, uh, point and uh, I like the fact that John brings it up, but again, I'm very skeptical about the ability of the African Union, for instance, to begin to be seen to be meddling in US elections. And I see <laughs> a danger uh, in the, uh, the African Union of African countries coming up and saying, you know, calling Trump uh, uh, by his real name. And, and especially given the fact that Virginia is telling us we may be surprised in November. So people have to be very extremely careful in taking positions on the US, uh, on the US elections. But, but uh, John was essentially making the point that uh, the US has been a role model for democratization globally. Uh, and Africa has been engaged in broadening the democratic space. So they should come up and stand out very clearly and tell Mr. Trump not, <laughs> not to rig elections. I think that's, that's the point, that's the point he was making. Yeah, so I thought I would, I would mention that, especially for our audience who are not familiar with the conversation, but it's an interesting uh, article. Finally, I think on uh, Kamala Harris, uh, 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 Virginia, I think you, you touched all the points, but what I just wanted to say that I think Kamala Harris is a, a product of the Black Lives Matter movement. And uh, she's also a product of the, the Obama, the kind of Obama movement. Uh, so she's building on especially the infrastructure where black uh, leadership could be accepted at the very highest level. So I don't think she's breaking new ground. I think she's breaking new ground as a woman, uh, but I think the, the Obama legacy, the very fact that uh, Obama was able to be elected, was able to be accepted uh, by a cross majority of American voters and to become president is a plus in, the, in that, uh, candidates such as Kamala Harris can then begin to, to come up and pick up on those, uh, on, in, in, in those footsteps. Uh, the expectation then is that uh, in the context of uh, what has been described as the two, two pandemics, the pandemic of race and the pandemic of COVID, maybe Kamala Harris could make a difference for the Democratic Party. That is, that is the expectation. Uh, but I think the more interesting issue that probably we need to debate, uh, Virginia, is um, if they did win in November and then uh, Kamala Harris uh, uh, runs in uh, the next election because Biden is too old, uh, and then Kamala Harris, the more fascinating element would be if she chooses a white woman as a, a vice presidential candidate. <laughs> I mean, so I think it's going to, that will be the most momentous shift in US politics, where there is gender, but there's also a generational component. But this all hinges on, as you are saying, whether the, this election, whether Trump is going to, uh, to be defeated. And I, and I like that skepticism. I think, let me stop here, Bob, and uh, uh, we have about an hour to get all questions on. Comments, uh, but before we do this, but I, I want to make a few comments. Yeah, sure, sure, by all um, means. Ideology, yes. Uh, it has actually been, I think, decades since, uh, I don't know, the different ideas really define different parties here. Um, that is, I think, different from many other countries. But uh, it's quite interesting to me to see that. Um, and yet, you know, this is also a moment in U.S. Uh, history when, um, I don't know, I, as I said, I think orally, but also in the paper, the, uh, the idea that um, parties could actually be really substantially different 
it's often felt in the U.S., but often outside the U.S., that's just not what people have seen. Um, what I actually think uh, of the so-called progressives is that they really are much closer to a, sort of a, a, I don't know, a Western European socialist kind of system than, than many people uh, thought possible in the U.S. I find it kind of amazing that there would be a leading candidate for the highest office of this country who calls himself any kind of socialist, who uses the word socialist. Um, that has not been seen here for, I don't know how many years, but many years. And certainly, Gilbert, I think you're right. The, the, you know, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, I know many colleagues, actually many academics, who stopped describing themselves as Marxist historians, Marxist political scientists, Marxist anthropologists, because that was just not allowed. Um, so now, I don't know, 25, 30 years later, there is, uh, there is something going on that I think is noteworthy. And as I said before, it's not really a French element. Uh, Trump might try to make them look and sound French by calling them the radical left, but it's actually a rather large plurality of the Democratic Party. And, and that's important. Uh, second thing, you mentioned young people. I, you know, I, I, I would be wrong if I didn't actually uh, say this again. One of the things that really has surprised me over the last few years, including in the last year, is that, that uh, Bernie Sanders continues to have an enormous amount of support from young people. Um, I, you know, the reason I say it surprises me is, you know, he's an old guy. <laughs> he's an old guy, very young, but he apparently uh, has the, you know, we can mock him, his manners, his speech, et cetera. Um, but, you know, he has devoted, I would say his, his fans, his supporters are as, as devoted as Trump's supporters are devoted to Trump. Um, it's, it's just, you know, very significant. So are they, are they the future? I don't know. Um, I think it's also quite interesting that a lot of what happened in the last two to three months with protests were led by uh, Black Lives Matter, African Americans. Um, I, I think back on the last two or three years, when, you know, I've been regularly teaching a fairly introductory a uh, course in anthropology, but that's social anthropology, social science. And whenever I talk about power, I eventually ask students, I say, well, don't you think you have some power? The answer usually has been no. And I have been annoyed. I will usually say, yes, my generation overstated its power, overclaimed, you know, we thought we could end the Vietnam War. We changed the country. We can do lots of things. But you, I don't understand why you don't think you have any power. I, I remember very distinctly two, three years ago, I, I asked this question of a class. There were about 50 people in the class. Two guys, when I asked the question, two guys raised their hands slightly. Can you see what I'm doing? raise their hands slightly, not, you know, raise their hands all the way. And, and I said, okay, uh, what do you mean you have some power? And they said, well, I have power over myself and what I do. And the other guy said the same thing. Two men, nobody else. I thought, so I don't know, this is a change. I find it interesting that a lot of this does not have to do with uh, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, uh, but it may have to do with a lot of their supporters. And certainly it has a lot to do with AOC, Alejandra Ocasio-Cortez. Um, I, I, I don't know who is actually uh, leading this effort to reform. Uh, I don't know if it's all young people. I don't know if it's certain young people. I don't know if it's by location or by you know, ethnic background, I don't know. Um, I would like to think that, that they are the future and that's fine, but you know, I'm also cautious. Um, as, to, uh, I don't know, as to Africa impacting Africa. Oh, 
this is public. I'm not really even supposed to, to, to say anything political, right? It goes against uh, you know, the rules of public universities, but I will, I, it just doesn't matter. Um, I actually, I, I don't know. You know, when you say Gilbert, uh, some things are really not new, that is correct. Uh, I think there has long been a rather sizable group in this country that uh, basically doesn't want immigrants. They see as not from Northwestern Europe. Um, there has long been a, a group of, of folks who would vote, well, they wouldn't even vote actually. Uh, nobody even in the Republican party was typically acceptable enough to them. Um, but I think part of what we're also seeing is a kind of, um, assumption that, um, I hate to say this, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of Jimmy Carter's and whatever, but even when he did his human rights efforts and campaigns in Latin America and so forth, for democracy against dictators, um, I think a lot of it was based on U.S. notions of human rights and U.S. notions of democracy. Um, I think that, that most folks in this country don't actually see anything that they, that they do or think or value. And that goes for the right, the center, and, 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 and the left. I don't think they see it as, um, as something mostly US. So my question in some ways to you and to others on, on, this, uh, on this webinar um, is, why would, why would Africa, why would South Africans actually uh, care or, you know, one could say Gilbert, I don't know whether, whether you're obviously saying this. I do think there's a difference between Trump and Biden and, and, and Trump and Pence and, and, and uh, Biden and Harris and the other. I do think so, but I think ultimately they are going to be U.S. policies towards Africa. Um, and I, I would like that not to be the case. I think that's correct. So let me leave it at that. Right. Thanks, Virginia. Right, I think, I you think know, I've, you. Lived, I've lived in lots of countries. I, I actually know what it is like to not assume that. But I think most people do. Go ahead. Go ahead, Bob. All right. Thanks. I think uh, this is the essence of a debate and a discussion and a conversation, in fact, uh, between two eminent professors, one an anthropologist, another one a, a political scientist. Uh, we get to hear quite some perspective on the same question from um, uh, various dimensions. Uh, I think there are two questions here already. and. Um, one question, uh, I think, is from an anonymous attendee uh, who asks, uh, it is interesting to see that some Republicans, unhappy with Donald Trump, have chosen to cross the floor and vote for the Democrats. Uh, whereas Democrats, fearful of the move towards a more lefty left, are opting to vote for Donald Trump. The question thus, will this flow crossing benefit Africa in any way? Uh, I think that's a question. I hope you've gotten it, uh, both uh, Virginia and Gilbert. <laughs> this flow crossing here for various reasons uh, allied to the divisions that you talk about. Uh, probably you can respond first, Virginia, then Gilbert. Okay. Um, I would not overestimate how many members of the Republican Party Actually, I know that there was a lot of emphasis over the last four days, Democratic National Committee, the virtual thing, they had all these various uh, Republicans who said they're voting for Biden, et cetera. But I, I think that's wishful thinking. I think I, those people are going to vote, but how many of those people were there? Uh, I, the issue in many ways is also who's actually uh, Trump. 
I don't think that the long-standing Republicans uh, actually like him very much. I don't actually think they think that Trump is a Republican um, any more than than you know, many Democrats used to think that the Bernie Sanders was not a Democrat. He was an independent. Trump has gone both ways, given money to lots of uh, folks. Uh, you know, I I don't know. Uh, I don't know that I would actually think that that has a much of an impact. I think it's going to be a very divided election, and I I don't know that I think that that uh, anything in Africa would be. Well, I don't want to say that anything in Africa would be improved. I think if Biden wins, uh, there will be at least. Uh, a difference in style, maybe rhetoric. Uh, I think Kamala Harris is actually uh, quite international. I think Biden's interest over the years has also been, I think, uh, foreign policy. Um, um, there are lots of things that would change, uh, some of them good. But ultimately, whereas Gilbert is nodding, right? Ultimately, I actually think that whoever is president of the U.S. is still going to be putting the U.S. first. And uh, I don't know that, that there is much reason to suspect that uh, a lot of Africa would benefit from this. I, I may be too pessimistic. All right. Uh... Thanks for those uh, interventions. And uh, now, Gilbert. You see, my, my reading of, uh, of US elections is that every, every four years, there are people who move back and forth. Uh, there are people who are born Republican and who are born Democrat, and therefore they probably don't shift their positions. But, but there is a, equally a larger uh, group of people who you uh, consider independents or moderates or so. So these people keep crossing back and forth. But the, <laughs> the, ultimately, I think decisions are not decided uh, by what those people do. And they still remain the independents, the cross, the, the perennial crossers are, are always there. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't think they significantly uh, really impact uh, uh, electoral outcomes. Maybe some elections. I've, as I said, I haven't really, I never, <laughs> I haven't studied U.S. elections as closely as some of uh, my colleagues. Again, to come back to Africa, uh, the larger point is more of what has come up as U.S. approaches towards Africa has remained very constant since the 90s. Uh, and this constancy, I think, is what we need to be focusing upon. What has remained constant and why? So my point is that we should not be worrying about who is going to be in the White House. We should be worrying about uh, what policies are in place. Uh, and there are not many. Uh, if you take it from the, from the premise that uh, Africa is still very relatively, very relatively distant and not too significant in, in the broader framework of US foreign policy. So that's the point I keep coming back to, uh, that yes, Africa does matter, but in the broader context of US foreign policy, there are only a few things uh, that are on the radar. So whether Trump is reelected, uh, whether Biden is elected, those things are not going to change fundamentally. And I agree with Virginia. I mean, it may be a change in style, change in tone, uh, maybe a visit here and there, <laughs> but, but, but fundamentally, uh, not not really um, uh, much change. And I think this should be uh, the, the the point I talk about in my paper about we should moderate, we should temper our expectation about who is going to be in the White House and focus on on other, I think, fundamental issues. Thanks, Gilbert. And um, I, I think you seem to be, interestingly, you seem to be concurring. Uh, and therefore, uh, this is indeed a dialogue of uh, like-minded. Uh, I wish John was on the panel, uh, because there will be a bit of fireworks. But I've seen that he has a comment here, which we will come to. 
in a short while. Uh, but there's a colleague here called John Matson who asks the question, I am surprised you are surprised. I think this is to Virginia, but Gilbert will also respond. And, and he says, I'm surprised you are surprised that young people like uh, Bunny, who is old, what do you consider the results? Uh, are th uh, there are quite specific failures of globalization and the excesses of uh, free market and expanding inequality. I think that second part of the question is not very clear, but it seems to suggest uh, that globalization and free market and uh, neoliberalism might be the reason why Bernie Sanders does very well. But let me leave it to, to Virginia first and Gilbert. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I saw that already. Thanks, John. Um, why am I surprised? Maybe, you know, you're not surprised, but I, I am surprised maybe for two reasons. One is that, that uh, a whole lot of young people I have known and see in the U.S. have basically not been polit politically motivated. Uh, I remember even a few years ago, uh, young people, students, I know all saying, you know, all politicians are corrupt. Doesn't matter whether, wh where they are ideologically, right, center, left. Uh, all politicians are corrupt. We're not going to vote for anybody. It doesn't really matter. What we need to do is other things. So uh, some of the surprise has to do with the politicization of enough young people. Um, to, to make a difference. The second is that I think um, age actually matters in the U.S. maybe more than it does elsewhere. Um, Sanders is now, what, in his late 70s? Um, I think it's quite interesting that uh, that is being basically ignored, uh, not considered important. Uh, there are lots of reasons that, that a lot of those people who support him um, are really, you know, they're against uh, basically capitalism. They don't call it that. But, uh, they're against uh, all sorts of things that are considered uh, forms of structural inequality. They're, they're against uh, a lot of the um, advantages given to corporations and the very, very rich. Um, but what's interesting is in this country, actually, uh, somebody in his late 70s would be typically often ignored or has been in the past considered too old. But apparently in this case, what he stands for is, is attractive enough to young people that it, it, it matters. Uh, but, but that's a change. And uh, that's why I think I have been surprised. Thanks. I think let's let's have then uh, Gilbert also respond on this. Uh, you know what w what is apparently uh, not typical. Uh, you know to see a situation where young people are supporting an older person. Gilbert, yeah. I think generational change is an obvious phenomenon in politics. I think every generation um, has new 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 people, new young people are always coming up with new ideas, but also. As John mentions there, that globalization and, and, and uh, excessive inequalities, these are things that are at the heart of uh, young people's concern. So anybody who elevates them, I think, to the agenda uh, will tend typically to be people who are going to be disadvantaged very quickly by these processes. And these are young people. Uh, if we take the older generations, maybe they're already retired, they are uh, they are wealthy enough and uh, they don't have too long to live, but the young people have to actually carry the mantle of politics. So I, I think the generational component, I think, is what drives politics. I, and and I, I want to, to insist on that point that uh, the nice thing with Bernie Sanders is that he was able to galvanize those, those voices much more explicitly than uh, the rest of the Democratic Party. But Virginia's presentation tells us, therefore, that in fact, uh, the, the Democratic Party is now beginning to buy lock, stock, and bury into that whole generational agenda that young people have been pushing. So this is a good thing, because as I said, generational change is what pushes, what drives politics. 
Okay, thanks very much. I think we'll come to this uh, uh, comment by John Tremlow. Um, mm -hmm. And even though it's a bit, uh, it's a paragraph long, but we'll try and read it pretty fast. And then I think it's an important one. I think, as you do recall, uh, Gilbert did uh, make mention uh, of John Stremlow's article, and uh, we all know that um, you know uh, Gilbert followed John at uh, the IR department. As there. So they, they have a relationship there, which sometimes uh, uh, takes the shape and form of debate. And, and so John's uh, comment is that the U.S. is at an inflection point, uh, as Harris noted in her acceptance speech. The ideology that was to my ears the defining one of the Democratic Convention is one of liberal democracy, a civic nationalism, as opposed to Trump's racist white ethnic nationalism. This election may not, set, may not settle this issue, and the ethnic nationalist history shows uh, are more, I think that there's an, a typo there, shows there are more ruthless and prone to violence. But this discussion does not seem to reflect Obama's brilliant but terrifying message uh, Wednesday night, I think the convention evening. Uh, the US is on, uh, on the verge of the greatest constitutional crisis since the Civil War. If Biden's inclusivity prevails, then I think Gilbert and I will have much to debate about continuity and change for the better in the US-Africa relations a year from now. Uh, if white ethnic nationalists somehow prevail, then the reverberations river nationally will also be far reaching, including here. So indeed a comment, but it's a loaded one. I'm sure you want to respond. Virginia first, perhaps. Oh, I thought maybe since uh, John was addressing this mostly to Gilbert, why don't you have change, have Gilbert first and then I'll- follow. Okay, so Gilbert, uh, Virginia has graciously <laughs> <laughs> passed it on to you, but also rightly so, since the comment is directed. Time, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no I, th I think last time we agreed that uh, we'll have this debate next year after the elections. Uh, and then we can continue the discussion about who is, uh, who is, uh, our, man in the, who is our man in the White House. And what, does, what is the implication for Africa? So I think I, uh, I, I'm still ready to debate you, John, on, on, on that issue. The fundamental question that I raised at the last time is that, uh, yes, the credibility of the US elections uh, uh, are at stake. Uh, and I like the point you make today in, uh, John, you make today in your essay about uh, we need to be serious. We need to be concerned about the degradation of American democratic institutions. And the rest of the world needs to be concerned uh, that in fact, uh, not everybody can vote <laughs> who should be voting. My bigger question has always been, how does the rest of the world inject itself into US politics? Uh, and I mean, it's, I can see that we are heading to a very dangerous horizon uh, where uh, there is an international outcry against the, U I mean, uh, uh, electoral manipulation in the U.S. But I, the bigger issue is, I think, there are limits to external action on U.S. elections. Uh, these elections are going to be fought and won primarily on national issues, on local issues. Uh, I mean, things like immigration may come in, Migration is a polarizing issue in the U.S., as Virginia has told us. But the bulk of, I think, the outcomes are going to be determined by very localized issues. And therefore, my caution is that it's very dangerous uh, for uh, other international, I mean, we've already seen 2016 elections, the Russian interference, uh, <laughs> which was, I think, the extreme of what you call international participation in U.S. elections. Uh, but again, everybody says, no, I think this was, this was not uh, really the best thing. Anyway, so there, there's very little Africa can do uh, to influence the outcomes of, uh, of the U.S. elections. And the best we can do is simply to wait. Uh, I made the point in my presentation that Africans vote, vote with their hearts for democratic candidates, which is understandable, which is historical. 
but even given that uh, 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 affinity to the Democratic uh, candidates via the Black American vote, uh, ultimately uh, the power dynamics uh, uh, are going to, to determine uh, who wins that election. And Africa can just simply wait and we, can, we should just wait and watch. Okay. Thanks for that intervention. Virginia, do you want to weigh in yes, on that particular one? I, I do. I don't necessarily want to comment on what Gilbert said, except that uh, some of the things that I think Gilbert and John are debating, you were debating two weeks ago as well. Um, but I, th I think there are some very important things that John is also saying. Uh, I, I can see this uh, question answered, so I can read the whole thing. Um, I too thought that Obama's speech was terrific, terrifically frightening in some ways. Um, and I do think that Donald Trump doesn't actually, well, it, let's simply say it, it, he has no electoral political experience prior to this, and it shows. I think that he thinks he can hire and fire, uh, he thinks that uh, he doesn't really have to go by the rules. I don't know that he actually understands democracy, not even the US versions of democracy. So I'm actually not surprised uh, at some of the things he's saying. I do think that, uh, as you put it, John, um, the US is on the verge of the greatest constitutional crisis since the Civil War. I don't know that I would put it that way. It is on the verge of a very serious uh, crisis. And, you know, I, I would not be surprised if uh, Donald Trump kept doing a variety of things to ensure uh, his election. And I wouldn't even, okay, this is gonna, sh gonna shock Bob even more. Uh, I wouldn't even be surprised if he tried to change uh, the rules that were in place after uh, Roosevelt, FDR, uh, so that he could run for president a third time. I, I, I think he would like to be king, um, I don't know, monarch, he would like to be, I, you know, I have arguments with my Italian colleagues about whether Donald Trump is like Berlusconi or Mussolini, you know. Um, I, I think all of that is true and I think when a lot of the Democratic uh, speakers this week talked about the soul of America, okay, it's a very Christian notion. Uh, I wish they didn't use that, but nonetheless, I think I would say, you know, the heart of, of the U.S. democracy, I, I think there are lots of things that are, are, are possibly going to basically lead Trump in a certain way. Biden and Harris actually believe in the rule of law. Uh, I don't think Trump does. Um, so I think many of the things that, that John said in his question comment are, are, are right. I don't know that interventions from the outside matter. I think Gilbert is probably right. Let us fight it out here. But, uh, you know, I don't know. You could try something. Anything you try is fine. Uh, any, anything you think could work is fine. The question is what would work? Um, I, I am not sure that, that uh, Trump and his administration care at all about Africa, North, Middle, or Southern Africa. Uh, I think they care about China and they care about Russia. And that's probably about it. Right. Um... The beauty with Virginia is that, uh, you know, you are candid and um, uh, sometimes we need to hear it in uh, those terms uh, so, that, uh, <laughs> so that there's no sugar coating <laughs> these things uh, in some ways. Yeah, but uh, and, uh, so we are coming to, towards the end. I, I, very shortly, I'll be asking for um, uh, our closing remarks. Uh, but before I do that, I think... Um, John Stremlow has uh, posed another question or point. I think he says electoral integrity is, an, is, nece is, a, is necessary if in an sufficient condition and Trump's attack may fail, but the threat is credible. I think uh, it wasn't a question, it was a, more of a comment. My, mm -hmm. question, um, my question as we go towards the end of this discussion 
uh, relates to Virginia's point earlier that uh, what is, is happening as from her observation, and I think Gilbert also touched on that, uh, is that uh, Biden seems to have shifted a bit towards Sanders. Uh, or there's an accommodation of uh, someone whom the core Democratic Party will have considered, uh, you know, a, a borderline fringe uh, person in the, in, the, in, the, in the ideology of uh, the Democratic Party's core. Uh, what does he say about uh, ideology? Now that we agreed, in fact, Gilbert said as much that ideology is a very important uh, consideration here. Does it, what does that say of the Democratic Party's ideology? An open-ended question. <laughs> I'm thinking. Uh, what <laughs> say? I don't know. You know, ideology used to be talked about a lot. I think um, it used to be published. It used to be discussed. Um, it hasn't been for some years, but that doesn't mean that it's not there. Uh, what is also, I think, important to note is that um, I think the Democratic and Republican parties have not actually been all that different for many years, but they are increasingly becoming very different. Um, I, I think that's largely due this move to what Sanders calls socialism to his positions. Um, I, think, I think of Biden as quite centrist. I think of Harris as slightly to the left of him. I think uh, Biden would have been more comfortable, ide I think, ideologically in terms of values and whatever with Amy Klobuchar. Uh, but that obviously became a problem, uh, a serious problem. Uh, one that she agreed with as well when uh, George Floyd was, was killed in Minnesota. Uh, but, you know, I'm also wondering what's going to happen now, because in some ways, um, Kamala Harris is not a typical vice president. I know that Joe Biden was a very active vice president and that President Obama actually um, appreciated him quite a bit. But I think she may steal his thunder, and it may be, it may be interesting. It may be difficult for Biden. Uh, it may be difficult for her to also sort of be quiet. Uh, some of that has to do with ideology. Um, I think Biden really wants everybody to be happy. I don't mean to be trite. But I think Biden really would like to unite everyone. And in, uh, those of you who listened to many of his speeches over the last four, four days um, in the Democratic National Convention will probably notice that the, the, the vast majority of speakers spoke about Joe Biden's empathy, compassion and empathy. They didn't actually necessarily talk a great deal about policies. Uh, I think that may have something to do with Biden's strength, but it also has something to do with the perception of Trump. Uh, in neither case is ideology an issue. I think, uh, I think there are things that are very US about this, um, but there have always been differences. They're called differences in values, just like Americans tend not to talk about social class, where it's there, right? So, for example, Kamala Harris may be the daughter of immigrants, but immigrants who are both very elite in their, in their family backgrounds. Um, there are things uh, folks in this country don't talk about, but that I think still matter. And it's called values, it's sometimes called ideas, it's sometimes called policies, but they're not necessarily called ideology. Uh, they may be that in the years ahead. Uh, I have no idea. You know, I'm not in the business of predicting anything. Uh, I'm just cautioning you that Trump may win in the fall. Uh, but I don't know what the next 10 years will look like. Uh, it's very interesting. Thank you very much. And uh, so Gilbert uh, responds to the same. Question. I think, you know, ideology is not static. Uh, ideology is negotiated uh, across time, across space, 
Uh, but what distinguishes, uh, I like Virginia's point about the lack of really big distinctions between the Democrats and the Republicans uh, over the years. And now this is becoming much more, uh, much more clearer. Uh, what always fascinates me about US politics is that, I mean, ideologically, uh, the Democrats have always, uh, I mean, hopped on to the very progressive, progressive agenda. So that has defined them for the most part. But even if you look at people like Bill Clinton, I mean, coming from the South, they had to begin to appropriate some of the, the very right wing, very conservative agendas for them actually to win. So there, there is no real, uh, the, yeah, the, the, uh, the ideology changes uh, with characters, with individuals, with leadership. Uh, and uh, so I can see why the Democratic Party would be uh, taking on very clearly a progressive agenda that uh, uh, Sanders has articulated in a way maybe to get into power. And maybe when you get into power, then you have to govern. Uh, and I thought that was the challenge of Bill Clinton. Now you have to govern. And then when you start to govern, you, you discover that uh, uh, most of your, your ideological uh, trappings are really not making sense if you have to appeal to a larger, a larger constituency. So I, I like the fact that uh, uh, ideology has always animated US politics. Uh, because as I said from the outset, uh, without ideology, really, there is no politics. We need to have somebody to stand for something. <laughs> and that means uh, it's, it's a basic uh, conception of ideology that somebody is different from the other because they, they hold some things very dearly to their hearts. And uh, the Democratic and the Republican parties have therefore tried over the years, really, to distinguish themselves around very core policies that they sell to the American electorate. But when they govern, then they have to be, in fact, more responsive to the agendas of their, their opponents and so on. And again, I think that is the beauty of politics. All right, thanks, Gilbert. I think there's a question that has come in, but it's pretty much from John. I think it's the same, same question refreshed a bit. Yeah, uh, and, 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 uh, and so I'll just take the liberty to ask perhaps the last question, which uh, both of you can weigh in as we go towards uh, your um, final remarks. Uh, and, and the question will be, I think both of you seem to concur that uh, Africa is not necessarily very high up uh, in the U.S. Um, foreign policy, whether Democrat or Republic, uh, or, or that there's more of continuity, as Gilbert puts it. Uh, so my, my question is, so what should Africans do about it? Uh, what, what really, uh, so should we just, I mean, how should Af Africans re respond to that? Uh, should we just let it be, or should we do something, if something, what? Or, 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 or you know, just say lay off. What, what do we do in these circumstances as Africa? Can I turn this around for a minute? Yeah, sure. I'm not the one who should answer what should Africans do. Uh, what could Africans do? That's a okay. slight rephrasing. Um, well. And um, I guess my, my question, you said I'm very candid. Okay, so let me be a little provocative here. Why do Africans care who the president of the U.S. is. Um, I could say, do you care who the, I don't know, the president of Poland is? Do you care who, who the head of state in Singapore is? I don't know. M many people will say it's because the U.S. is the sole superpower. Well, maybe, but you know, we'll, I sometimes think that other countries, uh, I don't know that I wanna say care too much. Other countries pay a lot of attention to what uh, the US does. And uh, sometimes that worries me. Uh, I think, for example, their response to that from a whole lot of Americans I know, regardless of their ideological position, 
is in terms of language. And, oh, everybody speaks English. No, everybody doesn't speak English. But, but that's just a symptom of this thing where they think everybody in the world uh, knows the US, everybody in the world wants to move to the US, everybody in the world uh, likes the US. Well, that's not really true. Uh, so I guess, you know, if I can sort of move this back uh, in your direction, um, you ask what should Africa do? I'm not going to tell you, but I guess I, I also wonder, maybe somebody could explain to me why it is that it matters. I understand that the center is an African center of the study of New York. So obviously I understand that, but not everybody is connected to the center. So you know, I, I think there's a lot of emphasis on what the U.S. does or doesn't do. Uh, I don't really understand it. Fantastic. I think you post uh, more question. I think there's a need for more reflection on that. But Gilbert uh, will also respond, perhaps. Yeah. yeah, I think those issues, we, we, we've we touched on them in this discussion and in the previous one. But I just want to respond to Virginia's uh, uh, a question on why does the U.S. matter to Africa? And, and uh, somebody, I think John gave a very good response the last time, which is uh, the U.S. has been a leader in, in multilateral institutions. So how they behave globally impacts on Africa. I think that's the, cheap, that's the easiest answer to that question, that the U.S. plays a dominant role in the global order. And often uh, that role impacts Africa down the road. Uh, and so that's, that's, I think, is the best, the best response. Having said that, uh, I think I largely agree with uh, Virginia when it comes to the issue. Bob, the question about why should Afri what should Africa do raises the first question, what Africa are you talking about? Are you talking about the Africa of the African Union, as, uh, as John Stremler argues, or are you talking the multiplicity of African states? the 54 African states. So it's very difficult to have a good debate about the US and Africa if you don't respond clearly to what you mean and what entity within Africa are we actually talking about. And the way we resolved this issue the last time was to say Africa needs to get a common approach to the United States. What is preventing uh, an African position towards the United States. Once we get that issue resolved, then we can begin to wonder who is interested in what is going to happen in the US elections because there is an African position. But my point is that in fact, there isn't an African position. Uh, there may be an AU position. This is what John wants the AU to do, is to condemn Trump. For, <laughs> for attempting to rig U.S. elections. Uh, but Nancy Pelosi has already said, uh, Trump is not just a threat to our lives, to our livelihood, but he's also a threat to American democracy. So why should the AU be taking a position on an issue that has already been, in fact, raised within the American context about uh, Trump probably is a threat to American democracy? I'm just saying, I don't think it's useful I don't think it's fruitful for Africa to be engaged in intramural U.S. debate in as much as we want to say that the U.S. Is, should be leading globally. But it's very dangerous for us to be injecting ourselves in those kinds of debates, particularly because we don't really know the outcomes. And I think that's my, my response to your question, Bob. All right. Thanks, Prof. I think there's a question, and uh, Virginia, you indicated in the box that you'd like to respond to it. Uh, no? No. no. I no. thought it was just the same question, rehashed. Yeah, with an extra line or something, yeah. Yeah, no, so that's fine. So in which case, then, I the think Democrats we'll have... Democrats respond concretely to this? Yes, they have not. Right. Sure. So that being the case, I think I will invite uh, concluding remarks um, so that we also don't uh, we keep our promise of uh, keeping this debate within two hours. So, you know, short, um, uh, you know, concluding remarks, whoever wants to go first between Gilbert and Virginia, um, no. welcome.
You want me to go first? Yeah, you, you can go first. Virginia. Okay. Um, I still don't know why uh, Africans pay that much attention. I, I, I think it's very interesting to see the rise of this very open, visible, uh, progressive movement, as Sanders likes to call it. But I think of it as a, a first century left. I'd like to think that uh, Gilbert is right, that this says something about future generations. I'm less than he is. Um, I, I think, uh, I think the, the, the early November election will be a toss up uh, more than many people think. And I am not in the business of predicting because I don't really, uh, I do think that that uh, Trump will do everything and anything he thinks is in his power to uh, to win that election. Uh, he will contest the election if he officially loses. Uh, he's now into the postal service. Who knows? I mean, I don't know who's giving him these ideas. Um, I worry about the impact of, of uh, Trump's uh, unilateralism. Uh, I understand that, that when Gilbert says, you know, the U.S. has been a major power in a lot of these uh, multilateral uh, organizations, et cetera, yes, but I don't think that's a good thing. So uh, that's one of those things where I think there would be a real difference between Trump and Biden. Um, I think that one last thing, and we haven't mentioned this, uh, not to I, I think the only way that uh, Africans, African countries, South Africa, or the African uh, Union could actually be heard would be to use U.S. terms. I, I'm being very direct here. I don't think that, 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 that speaking a language that uh, uh, folks in this country would not understand or hear uh, or, or, or really make sense of uh, would work. So in fact, um, folks in the African continent were to uh, make a comment about Black Lives Matter or, you know, the Afri African diaspora, uh, white nationalists as, uh, you know, the vast majority of the world is not European, right? It's not Northwestern European. So if you were to basically make a comment about racism in the US, that, that might be heard. I don't know that it would make any difference to Trump's positions. I think it would make a difference to the Democrats and then to Kamala Harris. Uh, that's all I would say. Thanks, Thank Virginia. Uh, and I think as we close, I've just seen here a comment from uh, John on Black Lives Matter. But I, I think going into it will be opening up a discussion with just only a couple of minutes to go. And so we note it and we'll uh, handle it next time. But uh, Gilbert, your closing remarks. No, I think the, the point about Black Lives Matter is that Africa made a, a statement of that. The, the AU made a, a clear statement that. Uh, uh, they, they were for, for George Floyd. So I, I don't think that's very unique. And, uh, but it depends, as I think Virginia is saying, whether that has any impact on the, on the political outcomes in the US. So my final remarks, I think, are that uh, we are living in very interesting times. Uh, and uh, this election is going to be important, uh, I think, largely for, for what uh, is being described as a uh, uh, constitutional challenge, but all, all democracies, all countries need these kinds of challenges uh, in order to demonstrate their sturdiness, their solidity. And, and I'm not uh, personally, uh, I'm not very much worried about uh, what happens in November because I think it is going to show us that in fact, uh, these American people can uh, can withstand these kinds of drastic shocks on their political lives. And, and I, I'm, 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 I'm uh, really uh, convinced that in fact, if there is a constitutional crisis, there are institutions there that are going to resolve uh, that crisis. And therefore it should not be 
uh, something for the rest of the world to be worried about. I mean, that's really my, 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 my last remarks on this issue. All right. Um, thank you very much, Gilbert. And on that note, we want to say thank you to our excellent speakers. I think over the last two hours, you've touched on uh, very interesting points and uh, points of discussion, you know, shedding light on uh, some um, aspects that we took for granted. Uh, I think one of the major ones that we learned is that uh, let's brace ourselves for a Trump administration uh, uh, from November 3 uh, onwards for his second term. Uh, even though in the last couple of weeks, uh, people have been observing opinion polls and uh, hoping and yearning and waiting and almost celebrating in advance uh, a Joe Biden win. I think that was quite um, an interesting observation to, that we got. We just want to confirm to colleagues who are participating, these are the attendants, that uh, recordings for this and previous uh, sessions are available, and that next Friday we'll continue this time around with a discussion uh, with, on, on, on African Americans, uh, and in fact, the diaspora dimension of uh, the discussion. So, once more, thanks, Virginia. Thanks, Gilbert. And this is where we'll end.